Well, good evening and welcome. Um, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. It's a true pleasure uh, to have you here and to have the opportunity to welcome you as our newest Catamount families to the University of Vermont. Um, our purpose this evening is to talk through many of the elements that we believe will help set you and your student up for a healthy, engaged, and successful first year at the University of Vermont. Next slide, please. Um, my name is Erica Calero. I'm the Vice Provost for Student Affairs here at UVM, and I'm joined this evening by my colleague, Joe Russell, the Assistant Dean of Students. Um, and we're gonna take you through in the next 45 minutes or so, we can spend longer if there are, are questions, of course, we're gonna take you through a variety of topics and questions that we, again, that we believe will help you prepare yourself mentally and emotionally and help you prepare your student for the transition to college. Um, cognitive rehearsal, that is the ability to plan and project is very important. Um, and we know that you've already begun that process um, and we hope to both support you and perhaps accelerate your thinking in, in a few areas. Um, we also wanna just name right at the top that it's important and we're gonna touch on some, on some sensitive topics. It's important to work through um, any discomfort that you may have with particular topics. Uh, there may be conversations that you haven't had yet or that you haven't had recently and we're here to help in to engage in some of that. Um, we're definitely prepared to, to welcome your students and all of the, the, the complexity and texture that they bring with them. Um, and we view this process of transition as a partnership. In the next couple of, um, we say days, I actually think it's gonna be a week or two, we're gonna make a recording of this evening's presentation available. Um, we'll email it out, we'll put it on the web. Um, so that you can view it again, or that families who, who haven't had the opportunity can access it. Next slide, please. Um, as part of our engagement efforts with you, with families, um, this evening's presentation is certainly part of that. We also have a Catamount Family Newsletter that you'll receive monthly, a Catamount Family Advisory Council, UVM Weekend, and other touch points along the way, because we really want you to know about uh, important topics as they arise, um, or as they become timely or relevant during the, uh, the course of the academic year. Uh, the transition guide for new families is something that we've created this year. It's, uh, you could think of it like a checklist, but it contains a range of topics. You've received this via email. It also has a home on our website. And I hope you'll access it um, and think through and, and ideally talk through with your student and with your family, many of the topics that we've that we've put forward for your consideration. We include both the topics and some sample questions. Um, so if you like it uh, printed out, uh, I know that among you, there are more than a few who are checklist oriented. Um, so we've got you in mind as well. Um, next slide. Okay, we're gonna talk this evening about, you know, some of the major points, you know, along the trajectory that, that encompasses preparation transition um, in the first year of college. And these two images really, I think, encapsulate the idea that there are moments of joy and connection and friendship. And then there are also moments where, you know, um, it's cold, uh, or there might be sort of some feelings of loneliness associated with the transition, particularly socially um, to college. Before we get into this, though, I want to invite um, Joe um, to speak a little bit to the to to the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act um, that's featured on our next slide, um, FERPA, as many of you probably know it. Thanks, Erica. And uh, I will add my welcome, everyone. We're glad that you've joined us. Uh, uh, not just welcome to the webinar, uh, but really welcome to the Catamount family. Uh, we know that this has been a a journey that many of you have been on for a number of years, uh, maybe two or even three years, culminating in your student uh, joining UVM. Uh, we're excited and we hope that you are excited as well. It felt helpful and important kind of upfront and early on in this presentation to speak very briefly about how UVM interprets and enacts FERPA. Um, I will spare you the kind of very lengthy legalistic. I'm not a lawyer, but um, sometimes it feels like uh, days that it feels like I have to be. 
um, the legalistic uh, interpretation of FERPA to break it down into a very few very important um, summary points. The first is um, that FERPA really is um, meant to be a law that supports your student and their success in college. Um, it also is a huge transition from many high school experiences into a more adult or adult oriented educational framework of university. And so the university will hold your student as the primary agent uh, and the person that we interact with most, uh, uh, most often. What it means is uh, if a family member were to call the university to ask for details, even about their own child, um, there are some limitations to what we can share and what we can say. A anything that's related to a student's educational record, their grades, how they're doing in school um, is protected under FERPA. And um, UVM encourages families and students to really have some healthy conversation about what does that mean? Um, you will hear if you were to call the university to ask, how is my student doing in class? You may hear someone say, uh, we believe that that's your student's um, right to be able to share that or not share that with you. And so it is a good point of conversation to have now with your student about what does that level of communication to home look like and sound like? How much detail is being shared? What do you need as families to hear from your student directly about how they're doing at school? There are some notable exceptions, right? Uh, uh, so in, in, in examples that relate to health and safety, we're absolutely gonna be communicating with families about that. Um, and we'll hear more about that as the presentation goes on. And really the hopeful takeaway here, which really sets the stage for the rest of this presentation is, that UVM really wants to partner with you as families in service of the success of your student. And so really that is, I think is that a helpful image is your student is the, the center and on either end providing support is the school and the family unit from home. Uh, and so there are some limitations that we sometimes have and um, there is a lot of opportunity for us to partner together and hold hands in support of advancing your students' development, maturity, growth, learning, um, and success. So we'll come back to some of these elements as we go through the presentation, but we just wanted to highlight a little bit about what that looked like early on um, uh, to set the stage. I'm going to hand it back over to Erica to get us started. Okay, thanks so much, Joe. We're going to start off by talking about the student success skill set you see here on the screen. We're thinking about broad bins of academic skills, social skills, and self awareness. And if we start with the academic skill set, um, this is really, I think, pretty familiar territory for a lot of people. Uh, and at the same time, uh, as you may intuit, or if you already have a student, uh, relative, you know, other person who, who has transitioned to college, um, you know that things move a little faster, sometimes a lot faster um, in college, and the level of uh, intensity and personal responsibility that students are expected to take is significantly greater. Um, and so some of the advice that we have listed here, attend class regularly, it sounds sounds pretty straightforward, and in, and in many ways it is, but it also um, can become a challenge for, for a student who is new to really managing their own schedule, uh, sleep schedule, social schedule, um, thinking about you know, some executive functioning, thinking about some choices and decisions that may feel uh, like, um, like students are being pulled in different directions. Um, the social landscape in particular can feel very attractive. And so really working with your student to, um, I mentioned cognitive rehearsal, you know, to cognitively rehearse some of those moments that may feel like there's a tough choice to make. One of the pieces of advice that we often give students is to make a decision in advance about the choices that they'll make um, in real time. And what I mean by that is, for example, um, I could make the decision now that I will um, always attend class. Or if I'm somebody who is reluctant to walk into a room full of people, if I'm coming in late, I'll make the decision now that even though that might feel uncomfortable, I will indeed go late. It's better to go to class late than to miss a class or skip a class. Tutoring and academic assistance abound. 
faculty are here really and truly um, to be supportive. Um, they have office hours. There are there are you know all kinds of opportunities for students to connect with faculty outside of the classroom. Um, and advisors are there along the way to to really deeply and substantively support the navigation of the academic experience and the co-curricular lives that students live. Um, it's also important for students. This last point um, is to you know make sure that they're staying on top of their academic performance as it unfolds. Um, papers will be graded, test scores will be posted. We have a learning management system called Brightspace, and these are all pieces that students are expected to. Um, you know, to learn about, explore, tinker with uh, well in advance. Um, next up, we have the the um, a little bit more about support around the academic experience. And here, sort of like Joe mentioned, you know, um, we, we sort of think in, in some images here. You've got concentric circles where the student really is at the center of the circle. And then there are there are circles of support that emanate um, from, from the student. Their primary advisor um, is somebody who can play a significant role in their life. All students um, have already heard from their advisors. They're going through a process of course selection for the fall semester this month. Um, students can choose to deepen that relationship. Uh, and, and that's often a really, a really positive thing that students can do in their first semester and beyond. Clearly the faculty the learning community that they live in and the teaching assistants, the TAs and the courses that they have. Not all courses have TAs, but some do, and, and in particular, some larger ones. Um, really phenomenal sources of academic support. Um, and then and then the structured support um, that we have here, tutoring, writing center, um, student accessibility services, which is where accommodations are provided and beyond. There is a difference between um, a student's academic dean uh, and the office and the supports that they provide and the dean of students. The academic dean's office uh, and the student supports that are provided there, which is where most first year advisors um, are situated, really exist to help students navigate the academic experience and pieces that are uh, you know, potentially going to impact the academic experience. Um, the Dean of Students Office provides a wider array of, of personal, interpersonal policy support and intervention, um, and Joe will speak a bit more to that um, in a few minutes. We'll move on to the next slide now uh, that covers a few high points in the social landscape. I think one of the most important things that I can impart is the readiness of our staff and faculty to, to help students out with things that they may encounter um, expectedly or unexpectedly in college. And in the same breath, that it's critical for students to seek assistance, to speak up um, in, in moments where they think that they either might or definitely do need help. There is, there is um, no concern on the part of any staff member uh, or faculty member that students might speak up prematurely or um, no, we, we really want to be available for students and they will have um, different thresholds for what support needs look like and we want to be there for that. Time management is a big piece of having a positive, a healthy, a fun social experience in college. Um, with that, you know, with time management comes boundaries um, and, and some of us have a, an easier time. Some of us have a bit of a harder time with, with putting boundaries on our time. Um, such that we're able to carve out plenty of time for friends, new friends, fun, clubs, activities, et cetera, but still retain truly sufficient time for the academic work that, that, you know, that, that needs to take place. Um, working through conflicts and openly communicating needs is something that many students have some experience with. We are finding that um, students who are in college now Potentially because of the, the 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 isolation, you know, the isolated experience that that impacted some of those social experiences um, in high school during the pandemic, um, we are finding that other students have a harder time um, thinking about expressing their needs. It feels more like conflict, and so this is another piece I think that families and caregivers and supporters um, can can really help students with thinking about 
what kinds of moments might arise where you need to speak up or where you need to um, protect boundaries for yourself. And of course, the decision making about um, all manner of health related uh, elements of life. Um, and we, you know, we're, we're using the example here of, you know, uh, substances, alcohol, but also sleep, um, studying, nutrition, you know, just making sure you're eating. Um, a couple of meals um, a day. Those are decisions that um, you want to make sure students are really um, attuned to and you know ready to ready to you know exercise their own kind of needs, preferences, and judgment. Um, and then finally, social awareness. This is something that is in rapid development at this phase of life. Um, I find that that students. Um, have increasingly sophisticated and, and rich vocabularies around how they're feeling, how they're doing, what they're perceiving in the environment around them and in the, what we call the academic ecosystem, the community. Um, and so that self-awareness is something that I think more and more students come to college prepared to exercise. Nevertheless, it's busy. There are a lot of people around and it's a very new um, lifestyle for students. Again, that 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 reality of you set your own alarm, you you send yourself to class, you decide when it's time to eat, et cetera. Uh, so I recommend, um, and you know, this is something we've observed at UVM for for many many years, that students who get in involved in clubs and organizations are able to create a lot of overlap between their academic lives, you know, the, the peers they interact with in the classroom or the lab or the clinical setting, uh, and, their, and their social lives. Again, the same peers um, are also all around campus looking for fun and engagement and friendship. And so getting involved early is often a very good idea that has to be balanced with, um, you know, over committing uh, there's so many, we have 260 active uh, clubs and organizations. There's a lot to choose from. And, and I don't know anybody who's participated in all 260 of them. So again, finding that, finding that sort of sweet spot um, for the initial level of engagement that your student wants is something that they should be prepared to pay attention to and make some choices around. Just because you sign up for seven or eight clubs does not mean that you have to participate in all of them. Um, you, you know, I think students are well advised to um, see what they like and then really invest their time and their, their, their emotional energy there. So that's an important point of self-awareness. Programs and resources that are, that are designed to inform um, or help students, you know, read your email. Uh, you know, we have a, a, a student facing publication that comes out weekly called Inside UVM for Students. It's got great information. Um, activities, events, quirky things. Um, that's an example of something that students can read and it'll help them make some decisions about where they want to spend their time. <clears throat> um, and then again, just, you know, back to this notion of, of self-awareness here. Um, if students, you know, if you wake up one day and you are not feeling in a way that you want to be feeling, that could be enough of a, that could be enough of a moment to sort of, you know, to speak up and to ask, um, your RA, uh, your advisor, perhaps a professor who you feel, you know, some some affinity with, you know, ask for some advice about, you know, what do I do next? Um, so these are all, I think, pretty important um, for you as, as family members, caregivers, supporters to be aware of. These are all conversations that you can have with your student. And again, as, as Joe and I are talking this evening, you'll you'll know when you hear something that feels particularly relevant to you. Uh, or really to your student. So I would really uh, encourage you to, to press in that direction. Um, next, I'm going to ask Joe to take us through a set of tips for supporting student success. Go ahead, Joe. Great, thanks, Erica. Uh, again, here are a few things. It's not an exhaustive list, but certainly some tangible things that we found over the years that um, we believe are really helpful for families and for students to be thinking through as you start your college career. So we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, firstly, we um, the hope and the assumption is that you have been thinking about kind of readiness for college for the for the past several maybe years, certainly the past several months as a high school career maybe has come to an end. Um, your student developing a sense of self, 
an ability to make decisions and show initiative, be an agent of their own success and future. Um, uh, an eagerness to get involved and an eagerness to be in school. Again, it almost sounds a little um, self-evident, and yet we see many students who flounder or um, struggle, especially in the early part of college, because they themselves have not found uh, an internal desire or motivation to be actively engaged in, in a school environment. Uh, eagerness, uh, again, a healthy social life, right? An ability to be able to cultivate healthy social relationships and some academic ability to be able to transition to uh, more rigorous college level work. So we believe that some of those things have already been happening in, in family units, that's the hope. Now is a recommendation or a reminder to do a little reassessment as the weeks and uh, days draw near for move in and the beginning of uh, their school career, really now is a moment to kind of pause and just ask the question, all right, uh, is our student being set up for success as they transition into UVM? So on the right hand side of the slide are some of the things that we've seen that will cause maybe us at least to have a moment of pause, or you'll hear me say this again, a moment of wanting and inviting conversation with families about what's a good plan to support a student if some of these things might be true. So if a student is withdrawn or isolated, a student relies almost exclusively on family for structure and support, and then you plan to send them off from California to Vermont and hope that they will succeed uh, is a moment to pause and ask, what does that really mean? Uh, a student who has difficulty coping with difference or conflict. Um, life challenges and disappointment really are a part of the college experience. And so if your student has a real difficulty with that, are they truly ready to be uh, in college on their own? And again, lastly, as we've mentioned, the student being at the center of this experience is really um, the concern that there are students for whom initiative or being able to seek out resources or do things on their own can be really challenging. So we're going to delve slightly more deeply as we move to the next slide um, into some of the things that we really would like to highlight for families and for students. Uh, here are some of the things that for us would want us to invite a family to say, should we wait a semester? Should we wait a year? Um, what should we do? Typically, when we give this presentation in person, when we used to before COVID, um, on this slide, all of the eyes went wide in the room. Like all the parents in the room kind of went like, what do you mean by OK to wait, Joe? This, There's no waiting. This train has already left the station. Like we, we're in college. This is, we've made a decision already. And the, the reality of that is um, that's not wholly true. Uh, between now and August, there's still an opportunity to think about is the beginning of college the right thing for your student right now? And so if any of the things on this slide are true for your student, I'm not gonna read them through word for word, but I'm gonna just highlight some of them, right? A new diagnosis or a major change in medication, a significant trauma, a suicide attempt or hospitalization, um, real uh, difficulty through high school years in being able to show and visibly demonstrate some of the skills that, again, Erica mentioned earlier, academic engagement, uh, social, good decision making, uh, all of those things. Um, you know, far too often we see um, uh, families, uh, uh, I didn't introduce myself fully, uh, the primary thing I, I do at UVM is that I lead our care team, the University of Vermont care team, which is a multidisciplinary group of staff who help support students and families when real bumps in the road happen, when a student may be going through a moment of crisis or distress. And so one of the things that always breaks my heart will be when I'm in conversation with a family in November about some of the struggles that their student may be experiencing, and there is this kind of almost as an afterthought, this sharing of, well, you know, um, just in April, they had a really significant trauma. They were hospitalized for a while, or, you know, this past year was really difficult for them, but we just wanted this to be a clean slate or a fresh start. We were just hoping that things would be different. Um, you know, what we were just really hoping that this would be a new beginning for them. And I think there are some students for whom that is true, 
Um, and uh, one of the things that I will often say when I give this presentation is hope is helpful, hope is necessary, um, hope is important, uh, but hope is not a strategy for success. And so if any of these things are true for your student, the invitation or the encouragement on our end would be that there be some moment of pause and reflection. That does not have to happen alone. We welcome uh, you to be, again, partners with us in that conversation. If you want to call my office, uh, share with me a little bit what the concern is, talk about what resources are available on campus, talk about any strategies uh, or ideas of what can we do to put a framework of support in place around your student to help them be successful. We welcome that. And we do think it's important just to name again out loud without trying to be too dramatic about it. If it feels, if your gut deep down is telling you this is not the right time, and that could be both your student and you as family members, if you are feeling that this is not the right time, we do encourage you to think about, all right, what can we do? It's not, um, it's not a foregone conclusion. That train hasn't yet left the station. Now is a good time to pause and reflect, come up with a strategy for success. Please feel free to partner with us about that. Um, or at least be in touch, at least be in touch with us if you'd like to discuss um, any of the things that are on this slide. So I will name it's not a foregone conclusion of um, you have to um, not come to UVM, but we are inviting you just to kind of pause and reflect around it. When we frame for families some of the supports that are in place or the strategy, the plan for support, some of them are on the slide. A student who has a 504 or IEP in high school, again, we'll often hear, well, in college, I just want to do it on my own or I want a fresh start and just kind of do it on my own. Please know, accommodations through student accessibility services are a really helpful, empowering, student-centered way to allow a student to really show up and be their best self academically. So we highly recommend connecting with that office. We have robust mental health providers. We have a robust student health clinic on campus with um, every student gets assigned a primary campus provider, a primary health provider on campus when they arrive. Um, there are lots of academic supports. Erica mentioned some of those before. And then your ongoing support from home, right? All of these things create a very rich and vibrant and effective tapestry or network of support that helps the student thrive and su succeed when they when they come to UVM. Let me move on to the next slide. Um, it's important also um, as we think about getting ready for college, Erica mentioned this, uh, and it is a direct ask of families to engage and have direct and personal conversations with your student. Um, there may be one more slide, one more um, bubble on this slide. If we can advance the slide one one further, we might get to see it. Um, there's, these are some topics that, again, we've found really effective and helpful for families prior and during, maybe even after college, to engage with their students. Research tells us family expectations around some of these things um, really are one of the highest predictors of a student's decision making in college. And so if you've not had conversations, this is a moment to be able to do that. And some of those things could be awkward or difficult. Um, when I share this with some of our incoming students, I will name the reaction that we see is a lot of eye rolling. When I say to students, yeah, you should be talking to your parents around, what about alcohol and substance use? What about sex and healthy sexual relationships? What about social media and what that's going to look like with you in college? Students be like, well, we're not. Why are we talking about that with mom and dad? That's um, there's a little bit of that cringe. And yet this really for us is very important. Um, we as a university are going to try and do this quite a lot, right? We believe that health, well-being, healthy choices, uh, strong, vibrant social networks are what make a student's experience successful. So we will do some of that. We can't be the only ones having that conversation with your student. We're going to ask and invite you also set time aside, uh, have some conversations, ask them what they're thinking. Again, the uh, family guide that Erica mentioned early on in this presentation lays out some really helpful questions that would be good to help kind of garner discussion and have around the dinner table at home prior to the start of college. 
if anyone has suggestions of specific things that they have started to talk with their student about that has gone over well or a question that has worked really well we invite you to put that in the chat and we'll try and publish those later on um, but we're going to move on to the next slide here and take this one level further for us we've been having a lot of conversations about healthy boundaries and what does that mean and what does it mean currently in the context of um, how do we keep ourselves safe uh, how do we uh, create an environment in which we can show up and be our best selves and study and be healthy and have vibrant relationships, but also hold in the reality of um, we live in community with people who are very different than, than ourselves and our students, we expect um, the same things from them. So how are we empowering our students to both have boundaries, set up some firm boundaries for themselves, but also show grace and understand that, all right, a small misstep um, maybe shouldn't lead immediately to being completely canceled from the group me fret chat on the floor. Um, one small misstep or one small misstatement or one small um, mishap shouldn't lead to completely being removed from a social network or a social group that the real growth and development happens as we remain in community with each other. So this is one of those tension moments of how are we keeping ourselves safe and drawing boundaries and also providing a, a level of grace and forgiveness that maybe we would hope for ourselves. And so again, on the slide are some examples of thoughts or ideas that our hope might be that you as a family unit with your student are engaging as we get closer to August and moving. Then move on to the next slide. Again, Erica and I have talked a lot about resources available here at UVM, and I'm just going to name out loud on this slide. I'm not going to go into great detail in, in all of them, but just the name. Again, this is a good, um, our encouragement for families would be for you to have at least minimal literacy in some of these things. Um, and so the example or, or the, the reason being, this is a really helpful moment of your student calls home in October and they're kind of having some questions or you glean through conversation or in direct conversation realize that they're struggling in a certain way or kind of feeling like they're not making progress as much as they wanted to. It's really helpful for you to be able to have some language to ask, well, have you talked to your academic advisor about that? Have you gone to the tutoring center? Have you been to the writing center? Um, did you follow through with student accessibility services and make sure that your faculty are informed about your accommodations? Right? Here are some things that really help you by asking questions and with some literacy, uh, then empowering your student uh, to connect to these services and to kind of find that solution themselves in a really effective way. Some of those are human beings. So um, every student who lives on campus will have a very robust network of support right around them very immediately. Their RA, who is a fellow student, um, and full-time professional staff who live and work in their residence hall on campus. They do kind of the logistics of res life. They also do some of like the programming development um, uh, around their learning community. These are um, staff members who are so committed to student development that they've chosen to live in a college apartment and work uh, alongside your students. And so always be able to ask, have you asked your RA about that? Do you know that you have an area coordinator or a program director in your in your learning community? Go talk to them. If they're not the right person or they don't have the answer, I will almost guarantee that they will know how to refer your student um, to the right resource or the right service. On the right hand side, again, are really helpful community resources on campus, many of them related to health and well-being uh, and safety. And so our encouragement again is for you as families just to kind of be a little bit familiar with these to help your student um, out from home as needed. Now we're going to go on to the next slide. Again, uh, lastly, before I kind of hand back over to Erica here to wrap up our tips, um, really we know that involvement and engagement outside of the classroom, I will argue inside and outside of the classroom, um, makes for a successful college environment and career. And so uh, I, one of the questions I will ask almost every student that I meet with will be, how are classes going? What cl what's your major? How, how are you, what, what's your favorite class? What are you doing outside of class? What's your favorite thing to do that's not 
class. And again, this is a great example that we will hear some students that that list might be just a little bit too long. And the conversation that we have is, wow, it sounds like you're really doing a lot. And maybe the thing that you, the gift you can give yourself is to kind of scale back on something. Or the other end of the extreme for me, worryingly so, is students who will look at me and say, oh no, I'm just here to do school. I really just want to do school. And so I'm not really doing anything else. And in the work that I do will be some gentle encouragement and trying to frame for them the value, the importance, and really kind of like what leads to then four years of a really healthy college uh, experience is engagement in clubs, organizations, intramural sports, student government, leadership, internships, engagements outside of the classroom are the thing that really kind of is the spark that brings to life the things that student learn, students learn in the classroom. So again, we give to you as parents a helpful thing to be encouraging and talking about is to be asking that question of like, so how did it go? You went to the activities fest. Did you find clubs that you're interested in? Are you going to go to the first meeting? How did that first meeting go? Those are great conversations for you to be having from home that kind of, again, uh, coax or encourage or allow your student to, to take flight. I think I'm handing back over to Erica to wrap this section up and to move us along. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, I love how you said for some students, maybe there's too much going on. I would have been one of those students and I could have used someone like Joe to say, there's gotta be, there's gotta be some dynamic balance um, in life. And again, we know that folks aren't coming in necessarily, um, or you know, we know that students are coming here to learn how to find that. But again, the conversations that you can have with them um, and that they'll have with people here, uh, we think will be very helpful. Um, again, in terms of communication flow, we really, really, really want to make sure that students are first using the, re well, are definitely using the resources, that, that the people uh, and the information that are here at UVM, even as they stay connected to you and to friends and as they get advice and, and sort of continued orientation to, to the university and to life in college from, from peers. Um, you can help by referring your student to university resources. You may have, you, you, you know, you may have already looked through a lot of the resources uh, that we make available via different websites. Um, and so it's helpful to be, um, you know, ready to point your student in those directions. Do know that again, and this is partly because of FERPA, but also partly to, to really um, accelerate communication. Um, if you reach out to, to faculty or to staff with, with sort of routine questions or concerns, uh, those folks are likely to work directly with your student rather than respond to you and, and have you shuttle information back and forth. Um, and it's also true, I know you know this, but I'm gonna say it now before there's a specific example that might arise. Um, do bear in mind that, that there are many sides um, to different situations. Um, and so you will get you will get uh, you, you you know you may hear about a complaint or a, con, a complaint or a concern from your student directly, and and what you'll want to do is help them um, figure out if there is more to uh, to the story or more to what they can find out that will be helpful to them. So um, I'm trying to think of a good example. It, you know, maybe your student is an early riser. And you hear from them, uh, breakfast isn't served around here. They may need to look and see. It, it may be the case that the that the dining hall in their particular residential campus is not open at 6:30, you know, uh, in the morning. And so they may need to look and see what the hours of operation are. Um, you know, that's a small example, but you know, potentially, uh, you know, an illustrative one. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I'm just going to briefly, you know, Joe covered some of these pieces. He mentioned that he runs the care team. This is a team of incredibly talented staff from across the institution um, who really, really, they function as, I mean, uh, it, it's such a, it's such a fabric of connection and support for students in all different kinds of circumstances. And associated with their work is this thing called the care form. And you can Google it. It's on our website. It's an opportunity for absolutely anybody um, to, to sort of speak up, to say something, to let us know that, that something is um, amiss, perhaps. 
there's no threshold. And so any level of concern felt by anybody can be shared there. We, we certainly um, typically assume that we're, you know, that the form is used not for, um, you know, sort of trivial, you know, like lost and found, but really that it relates to the experiences of, uh, of students. So if you want to fill out a care form for your student, um, if your student wants to fill out a care form for a peer, faculty fill them out for students. I have filled them out for colleagues. Um, this is a way for absolutely anybody to get um, to get attention on a person who may be having a challenging experience that we might be able to intervene and help with. There's an opportunity to say how urgent you think the concern is. So it's a really good one. Every semester we tell folks about policies and resources. That's an email that everybody should look for. Um, students, you know, really, it, it's a good place that you know if they hang on to that email, they can search it uh, and and go back and read any relevant policies at any point along the way. Very importantly, we have an app called Live Safe, um, and it's you know you download it. It's got direct contact to our UVM police services. It's another place where you can submit a care form. There's a safe walk feature that's a little bit like, um, you know, that function in Google Maps where you can send, you know, you can drop a pin and then you're, um, I do it with my kids, you know, I can sort of watch where they are if they if they share their pin with me. Um, you know, within our community, anybody can, can sort of um, ask for a safe walk. So if you're walking at night, for example, you can have your roommate uh, just kind of follow follow the dot along on the map. You can talk on the phone also. Um, cat alert notifications come through the cell numbers that we have uh, on file for students. And so if there is a traffic accident on campus or a building um, you know, emergency, you know, perhaps, um, you know, a, a, Oh, I won't give examples there, but you know, you can think of all of the reasons that we would want to let people know, you know, avoid this particular area or that particular area. Um, in the event of a, of a campus wide emergency, um, we would be contacting people through the through the, the cat alert system. And so it is really important for us to have current cell numbers um, of of every student. Very, very important. Um, we, we reserve this for true emergencies. We do not spam people. We will send a test you know, every semester or so to make sure it's functioning properly and that's it. And then our medical amnesty program, this is a really important one. And Joe, I'm gonna ask you to hop back on screen and talk a little bit about the importance of the medical amnesty program and how it's a way that students can support each other in some pretty difficult moments. Yeah, thanks Erica. And this is one that we really highlight to students, every student as they arrive on campus, we present this to them in orientation. Um, the short version of what this policy or program says is we prioritize health and safety over everything else. And so not surprisingly, there are often concerns that if a student might be or their friend might be engaging in something that could be considered a potential policy violation at UVM, they may have had alcohol or maybe drinking or may have used some um, kind of cannabis or other other substance or drug and they are not doing well there is always this kind of like a, well we can't call we're going to get in trouble or oh no they don't want to they don't want to call because um, the RAs or the police will show up UVM has a very robust medical amnesty program uh, it is so robust that even when students don't know about it themselves they still benefit from this program. And really what it says is, if any student calls for help for themselves or another student, they will face no punitive consequences from the university. And so um, there will be some follow-up. We want to make sure that that person is okay. We're gonna have a conversation about how they're doing. Sometimes it means a trip to the hospital, right? So families may get a late night call or text from their student that they're at the emergency department because they had too much to drink. Um, so we're going to check in with your student and make sure that they're OK, but they're not going to be in trouble. And so, again, this is a very common uh, program across universities because we don't want students to be trying to hide or take care of themselves or not call for help when they need it for fear of some kind of repercussion. And so we're very clear with students. Students know that this exists. Sometimes students know it a bit too much. They will call and be like, this is a, a map. It's a map. And we're like, you don't even have to say the words, but medical amnesty will apply, and it's a really helpful, um, a helpful encouragement so that students will always get the help that they need when they need it. 
I'm I'm also happy to go through the the next couple of slides, Erica. I realize that I think I might have handed over to you one slide too early. That's okay. It, actually, it, while we're still on 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 this slide, Joe, there's a question that I saw someone put through, and and I want to connect it to what you're talking about now because you've spoken to the medical amnesty program. We've talked about the care form, but there's a really great question here. Um, that someone has shared regarding boundaries and relationships and and how to know when a friend's problem exceeds your as a student your ability um to to intervene or to or to be helpful um you know potentially because it's too complicated potentially because you might really deplete your own you know you might you can't pour from an empty cup right um, you might deplete your own ability to 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 feel um, uh, you know what I mean. You get the idea. So so can you speak to the boundaries piece and sort of you know if a problem is so to speak above your pay grade as a student, um, how what can students do? Sure, great question. And it's not surprisingly something that we see very often. Uh, I will take away from it often the underlying, really amazing that we uh, are a close community and friends want to help, um, that friends have each other's backs, my roommate or my friend, I'm going to do everything I can to help them. And with some regularity, we have to have conversations directly with students to encourage them to do that reflection of, um, is being their sole source of help actually the most helpful thing for your friend or roommate? And can you be a friend have their back, be supportive, be an encouraging roommate or friend, and enable, normalize, encourage connection to other resources and resources that often, as you said, are really tailor-made and specific for that student's needs. And so again, families, I will say, if you are ever hearing from your student, I don't know what to do, I feel like I'm at my wit's end, I'm doing everything I can, and it doesn't seem like it's enough, I think it's okay for you as well from home to be able to normalize and say, I think you are doing as much as you can. And I think the thing that needs to happen now is for you to be able to connect your friend or your roommate or whomever it might be to the robust resources at UVM, allow that to happen. And then you can get back to the place of just being a friend. You don't have to be a doctor or therapist or counselor or right. all of these things that maybe again, beyond a typical friendship or roommate relationship. Um, one of the things that will often, again, will highlight for students and families, the care form is a really, really effective tool to be able to connect that person into resources, right? It could be submitted anonymously, um, and it allows us to be aware of a circumstance and say, wow, this student might be really struggling, and maybe they could use some additional resources, and then we can intervene connect those students to re resources, do appropriate referrals, provide a little bit more of a, of a support network, and then it actually allows all of the friend network to kind of relax a little bit and get back to the place of just being friends. So I really appreciate that uh, question, Erica. Again, I would encourage families to be having this kind of conversation with your student. I think it's a really helpful thing for you to be modeling. Many of us have these examples in our own lives. And so telling a story to your student to just say, yeah, well, I went through a similar thing. Here's here's what happened. Here are some of the mistakes I made. Here's what I learned. Here are the things that I might recommend. Ultimately, you get to decide what feels right. But, you know, I do think uh, connecting that person to professionals who know how, how to manage these uh, uh, situations can be helpful. I'm going to move us on to these two slides, and these are going to go very quickly. This is really just for families to just look at. Um, here are some of the resources and, again, very helpfully for you to have some literacy around things that we tell your students so that you can also reinforce these messages with and for them. Um, many of these are kind of safety minded, right, that we um, uh, our buildings are locked and require ID to, to enter them. We have staff on call. We have a full a fledged police agency that thankfully does not come in and operate like a police agency. They have all the safety accoutrement of police, but they really understand that they are on a college campus and student development um, and safety is really the, the focus. We ask students to lock their doors and not prop exterior doors. We ask them to have a plan with each other, 
communicate that plan with each other when they're going out, check in, be safe, not let strangers into the building, and to know the rules, right? So these are all things that we expect of students. We're going to go to the next slide as well. And again, some of the ways that we try to reinforce that, um, your student is going to be asked to do a number of online learning modules prior to arrival in August. These are actually very important, and I know for many students it kind of seems like it's busy work, um, but this really is one of the primary mechanisms that UVM will orient students to the expectations of what do we expect of you as a catamount? What will be your relationship with several different topics? And so it's really important. We're going to ask you to be good partners and really be encouraging your student to do those in a timely manner prior to moving in August. Uh, we've covered medical amnesty. Again, we've covered um, uh, the care form and how to refer a friend through the counseling center. Um, and we encourage students to really have a deep understanding of at UVM, we expect catamounts to be looking out for each other. And if they see something that is concerning or unsafe or worrying, um, that they would step up and be active, either call for help or do something themselves directly, right? Whatever it might mean, not just to walk by and pretend it didn't happen, or not just to kind of sit idly by while someone else might be really in need of support or help and do nothing. Those are just some things for you as families to know uh, that again are helpful to reinforce with your students. Um, and uh, Erica, am I either missing anything or now I think is the time that I'm gonna hand back over to you just to wrap up this section. Sounds good, Joe, thank you so much. I'm going to reiterate um, some of the ways in which we communicate with families on the next slide. Um, there are a few points in time where we will contact you. Um, well, so I mentioned the Catamount Family Newsletter. Um, if we could advance one slide, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, we've got the Catamount Family Newsletter. Again, this is a monthly email communication and it, it tends to contain some links to information um, but it also typically will contain a, a prompt, um, a, you know, a question or, or a, a topic area that you could be uh, usefully informed about in order to be supporting your student at that point in time. And then before major moments like um, registration for the following semester's classes or a break that will probably see your student coming home for a visit, and, and again, knowing that they're 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 experiencing so much and changing so much um, during their time on campus that there may be a bit of a moment of becoming reacquainted with them. And there are useful things that you can do to sort of mental, mentally prepare yourself, but also be be open and 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 affirm the changes that your student is experiencing um, while still maintaining that that sense of, you know, your family identity and your relationship with your student, your, your child. Um, uh, let's see, alcohol and other drug violations will tend to prompt letters home because they are pretty connected to, to safety and, and broader sort of personal and academic functioning. Um, those are often situations that we do um, very much need you to know about. Certainly, if a student has indicated that they are a danger to themselves or others, we don't take chances. We will we will pull you in. And if there is a major event on campus that impacts, um, for example, a residential hall, an academic building, um, or the or the entire community, we will we will communicate about that as soon as we have enough information to say anything with certainty. Which it doesn't tend to take very long, but. We want our, um, our first responders, we want our helpers to be focused on the task at hand and then we'll communicate as quickly as we can. So if we go to the next slide, this is a prompt for reflection. Oh, no, it isn't. Um, this is a summary <laughs> of the tips we've shared. Um, and so just going through this again, you'll, you'll see in summary form, um, you know, thinking about your students' readiness, really sort of pausing on that question about, you know, is is this the right time? Um, having some personal, you know, some really deep conversations about high stakes topics, um, how and when to refer students, um, you know, whether students refer themselves or you help in that process, referrals to resources, making sure that engagement is happening and is balanced. Um, of course, understanding how communication flows and the idea that hope is not a plan 
um, hope is, is um, you know, we talk sometimes about how it's a responsibility even. Um, hope is many, many things to many of us, but it is, it is only part of a plan. Um, next slide, please. And here we're going to reflect for a moment. If you could share um, over to us, you know, one or two takeaways or action items that our conversation so far has prompted you to consider, um, that would be great. Alternatively, you can just jot it down for yourself. This is great fodder for conversation between you and others at home, other families who are also sending kids to college this fall, um, and you know, and just others in your own life who are who are, who you look to for conversation and support. Um, we know that we're talking a lot about preparing your student. We're also very cognizant that you're about to go through a life change um, as well, and and that that actually matters a great deal. So wherever you get support and however you can influence um, and support others, this is this is the purpose of our our reflection prompt. If we go to the next slide, uh, we get into. I get really excited uh, when I start talking about fall, uh, not only because students are coming to campus, but because for anybody who is living through the current heat wave, it's going to get a little cooler, and it's going to be the it's going to be so beautiful on campus, so beautiful, um, and we hope that you'll visit. UVM weekend is at the end of September. It's typically the most gorgeous weekend. I'm not superstitious. I mean, it is the most gorgeous weekend of the year. Um, and we just have a beautiful environment for you to come and enjoy. We will be sharing a little bit more. We typically keep it fairly low key, but fun. Um, so if you're able to join, we'll be thrilled. Couple of reminders on our next slide. Um, again, just going back to, to two really important things. Um, the Live Safe app is very, very important to download and start tinkering with it. Just become familiar with it. Uh, and then, of course, those modules, the, the pre-arrival, the pre-matriculation um, modules that students will receive via email, we would love it. We would love your help in prompting students toward, um, you know, they'll, they'll get email um, and we'll tell you about it as well. But if you could help students prioritize completion of those modules, they form really the basis of our community standards. Um, it'll be beginning next week through August 18th. There's a series of modules. They are required to complete four separate mini courses. Students should set, you know, they should set aside an hour or so, maybe a little more for, for each of those modules as they come through. And again, it's mental health and well-being, alcohol misuse, consent and sexual harm, and how to and, and bias reporting. Um, so again, as you can see, clearly, clearly very important. We we would suggest also that you take perhaps 20 minutes um, each week and just kind of carve out a little time to be talking about um, about some of the tasks and also having some of the conversations with students um, that that are important to have prior to to coming here for you on the next slide um, I mentioned that you're going to go through a pretty big transition as well as as the folks who love um, our, our future catamounts um, do remember to pay attention to how you're feeling um, do listen to your spidey sense. Um, do think about what it's going to feel like to loosen or possibly let go of the reins. Um, there, are, there's such a huge range of of sort of family dynamics. Um, so it, it's hard to speak to this, you know, succinctly. But but whatever it means for you to begin to prepare yourself um, and provide a little bit more latitude, a little bit more autonomy this summer. Um, all of that will really help prepare your student. Um, please do send them mail, flat mail, ideally. It'll get here faster, um, but but there's nothing like being a first semester college student, going to your mailbox, uh, opening it up, and there's something, there's just something um, special from home. Special just means that it's from home. Um, could be a postcard, a little note, could be a picture. Um, and incredibly importantly, Please, please um, continue to tell your students that you love them, that you're proud of them, that you trust them. Um, this is incredibly important for them as they themselves go through their own process of preparation. Part of that will be with you, but part of it really will be, um, you know, sort of within their own thinking, within their own hearts, um, and for and to be anchored to you, to continue to be connected to you, and to feel your love and your trust um, is uh, is really important and um, helps helps them feel confident. 
uh, embarking on this next phase of their lives. Insight sessions that we have um, are coming are coming right up next week. Um, we'll we'll have one that is about student accessibility services. This is very very important um, for students who who have, um, as Joe mentioned, 504s, IEPs, who may have different needs that we will want to accommodate when they arrive on campus. And so there's a session on Monday. And then on Wednesday, we're going to talk dining. Um, food's a big topic. We do a great job with food. Um, and so come to that one and, um, and be prepared to learn all about dining. We're just about at time. Um, and so I do just want to take a quick, quick look at some of the questions we've received. So um, there's a question about what are those fall visit dates? I do want to get those um, just back in front of you. I think it was the 29th. 27th through 29th of September, okay? Um, so that's that's the fall visit. Um, and then there's a question about, can the student do all the modules in the first week if they're away all summer? It's a lot of time. Um, I think what we'd really like to see, and, and again, because there is, there is a, a pretty significant informational and educational component of this, um, we'd really like to see students stretch and try to find internet access to be able to do these modules. You can do them from, from a smartphone. Um, and so if at all possible, um, we'd, we'd really encourage um, those modules to be completed farther um, in advance. Okay, we've got a California family here asking, what's the best footwear for winter? Well, Joe, I think you could answer this. Um, you, <laughs> you've made a transition from a warm climate. What do you think? So uh, Eric is alluding to the fact that I grew up in Jamaica uh, and then came, uh, never thought I would have settled in Vermont. Uh, I started working at the University of Vermont in 2005. So I've now been through several winters. Um, the short answer is there is no one good footwear that you need for winter. Again, I will name a, a solid good pair of waterproof, shoes or boots but yes. it can't be so robust that when you get into a classroom all of a sudden your feet are like melting and so my encouragement would be for students to kind of like transition in slowly thankfully fall usually allows that to happen they don't need winter boots in august they will not and so as they get here they will be able to talk to friends they'll be able to go to the stores um, there's a wonderful store downtown burlington called outdoor gear exchange that has a whole host of all kinds of outdoor and winter especially uh, gear that students will need so they will have plenty of friends I, I will also name the 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 foreigner in me will say to the californian this is a good opportunity to like make some connections with folks who are from the Northeast and just say, can you take me and can you give me some suggestions? And it's a wonderful opportunity for some connection and some relationship building because there will be many people who will love the opportunity to say, let's go shopping. I got you. We'll do this together. That's great. That's great. Um, there's a question here. How does one begin the process of, of obtaining accommodations for learning difficulties? Um, two things. One, our Student Accessibility Services, SAS, SAS office, has a website, um, and they'll get you started um, right there with information on their website. Um, the other thing that you could do is attend the Insight session on Monday, uh, June 24th at 7 o'clock. It is an introduction to that process, and so you'll, you'll hear it explained in some detail and have the opportunity to ask questions there as well. I will just jump in and name explicitly on the Student Accessibility Services website, on their homepage is a button called Getting Started with SAS. And so you mm -hmm. click that button and you fill out a form and that enters the queue of being able to then connect to that office for formal accommodations. A question with regard to tutoring. What steps do students take to engage in tutoring? What's the best way to bring down barriers of entry, such as our student feeling embarrassed about asking for tutoring? I mean, I'll take a whack at this and then Joe, I'll invite you. Um, <laughs> tell them that some of our strongest students go to tutoring. Um, it's, it's a phenomenal way to learn with and from a peer and all kinds of people go to tutoring. I mean, you know, some folks wait until they feel like things are getting, you know, a little hard or they've missed some content and they're struggling. A lot of people build it in right at the beginning of the semester. And I've worked with students for years upon years who um, I'm talking 
very, very um, high performing academically, high performing students tutoring every semester. Um, it was really part of their academic success plan. Joe, what would you add? I, I will echo the, it's like going to the gym, right? It's not just people who need to get fit who go to the gym. Everyone goes to the gym. Um, and the logistically, the uh, we also try to make tutoring really accessible. Uh, it's available, again, students are going to be told to download the Navigate app, which is a very uh, academic engagement app for them here at UVM. They can make appointments through, the, uh, through uh, their Navigate app. And if they go to uh, the tutoring center, like that's a good helpful thing that you might want to say to your student before you ever need tutoring, physically go find the tutoring center, yeah. walk in and introduce yourself. And then, you know, if and when you start to feel like that's a need, you've already crossed over that bridge of where is it? What do I do? How do I do it? You've you've unpacked that and unwrapped that box early on. Yeah. Another question um, from the beginning of the presentation, how does a student deepen their relationship? Joe, I'll ask you to field this. How does a student deepen their relationship with their primary advisor? Are there are there things that they can do, steps they should take? How would you, you know, how would you advise somebody? Yeah, it's a great question. I, what's helpful again at UVM is that all incoming students get paired with a professional full-time advisor, right? So someone who is, uh, they are not just trained, but have passion and experience in really focusing in the student advising relationship. And so my, the, the, it sounds simple, but the deepening of the relationship with an advisor comes with, like maybe any relationship, time and effort and investment. And I think students may be inviting students to understand that they have the agency and the right, and we would actually encourage them to have a deep, robust relationship with their academic advisors. And if they are feeling like that's kind of not going great at first, they can always speak up and say something to someone. Or again, my encouragement would be to invite a question of, like any relationship, have you spent enough time yet to know that this is the right thing for you? And so maybe make it an appointment, not when it's a crisis, not when things are falling apart, but just make it an appointment to give an update about how the semester is going, how academics are going, how my experience is going, and to have a conversation really goes a long way. Last question for you, Joe. Um, I'm just I'm aware of the time, and I'm I'm uh, I want to respect everybody's you know other evening plans. Here's an interesting one. Can parents ask for proof of grades as a condition of tuition payment? What would you what would you say? <laughs> uh, the first thing I would say is that parents can do whatever they want to do. First, first of all, that's your choice. I will say, and it's a great question, um, to, to put more nuance to it, what I would often encourage families, parents, and students to have a conversation about is where does that level of independence and agency go? Uh, I would argue that there is a little bit of a social contract that is happening uh, between families who may have some financial stake or investment in education and a student's experience on campus, right? Uh, um, and so I, I, I'm not quite sure that it would be quite as robust as like, if you don't give me your transcript every semester, I'm not paying tuition. But there can and should be a conversation with your student about, well, what does that level of communication look like? How will we know how you're doing? Um, without going too far down this rabbit hole, one of the things that can be really hard for a student who is who is not doing well is that conversation with home and family to say, it's been rocky, I thought I was going to be doing better, that exam didn't go so well, I'm worried that I might not get a good grade in this class. That's a really vulnerable, difficult conversation for students to have. And so my encouragement would be, I don't know that you need to kind of maybe lay down the law and say, well, if you don't give us your transcript, we are not paying for college. But to name for students, we're investing in, in college and there is a little bit of a social contract of, we don't need to micromanage and know every single grade that you're getting, but what would feel comfortable for you and what will feel comfortable for us and how do we meet in the middle about knowing what grades look like throughout the course of college. It could also be that earlier on, you might lean a little bit more into, we'd like to know a little bit more and okay, first semester went well, <laughs> second semester went well. So sophomore year, that those reins can get, as Erica mentioned, those reins can get slackened just a little bit, right? You can then give some more agency and independence because there've been some kind of proven success. It's a very individual, nuanced, personal conversation, but maybe the encouragement is that you just have the conversation and not take things for granted or just impose your own will without conversation or dialogue would be my thoughts.
you know, Joe, you're making me think about how it's, it's, um, you know, there's, there's sort of, you know, logistics that underpin some things, but there really is an opportunity for families to, to evolve together. Um, college may be for four, four years, four years and change, but um, as families, you're going to be together for a very long time. And so these, these um, things that may feel really logistical can actually help set you up for, um, for other conversations and, and evolving relationships. And that's, um, that's a really good thing at the end of the day. Um, I noticed a late breaking question came in about the food. And so I'm just going to point you again to the dining 101 session that will be next Wednesday at seven o'clock. So Monday is accessibility services. Wednesday is dining. Both are at seven o'clock and, um, and you'll get a chance to hear a lot and ask questions again there. We're gonna have to leave it here tonight. Thank you again for joining us. It was lovely to, to be with you, field some questions and share with you some of the insight we've gained over the years. Um, don't hesitate to be in touch. Um, you'll be hearing more from us this summer. Thank you and have a good evening. <laughs>